Zanzi Africa Molweni. It is official. The Cape Town City Hall is to host the 2022 State of the Nation Address next week. This is an important step towards ensuring that Parliament works after the devastating fire. Parliament is a crucial platform to address the many challenges our nation faces. Arguably, the most pressing crisis is the poor state of our education system. In the spotlight this week, we examine the reasons behind our high dropout rate in South Africa and the impact lockdowns have had on our educational outcomes. But first, we take a look at the weekend headlines. The public protector has confirmed that she's received a complaint that President Cyril Ramaphosa has allegedly breached the executive code of ethics. This after a leaked audio recording in which he appears to admit that public finances are often used for ANC campaigns. The World Bank has approved an 11.4 billion rand loan for South Africa. The money is said to help to protect the vulnerable from adverse social economic effects of the pandemic. We simply don't have the wiggle room to pay something like this back, albeit incredibly important. The Special Investigating Unit's report into government's procurement of COVID-19 goods and services has revealed widespread misappropriation and graft. More than half of these contracts, worth upwards of some 14 billion rand, have been found to be irregular. Second part of the State Capture Inquiry report will also be released today, and it follows years of testimony in, uh, into allegations of undue influence on the state by politically connected individuals. Of particular interest to the general public will be what comes out in relation to power utility ESCOM, rail entities Transnet and Prasa, as well as public broadcaster the SABC. This week in the headlines, Ramaphosa once again places the ANC above South Africa. Half a billion rand of COVID-19 funds still missing and the second part of the Zondo Commission's report was released. In a leaked audio recording, President Ramaphosa admits that the ANC often uses public money for ANC political campaigns. And for those who still believe that this president puts country before party, I'd like you to listen to this. Investigations will reveal that a lot of public money was used. And I said in this case, I am prepared to fall on the sword so that the CR-17 campaign, yes, should be the only one that's looked at and not the others because the image of the African National Congress is what I am most concerned about. Each one of us knows that quite a bit of money that is used in campaigns and passing people around and doing all manner of things is often from state resources and public resources and we cannot kid ourselves when it comes to that. For the first time, we hear exactly how the ANC used public funds to fund a political campaign. But perhaps what is most shocking is that the president admits that public money, yes, your money, has been used as the ANC's private ATM for decades. But don't take my word for it. Listen. Soon they will be revealing about how money from the SSA was used for some campaign. And I said, heaven forbid. I would rather they say, yes, you got money from this businessman for CR-17 than for the public to finally hear that their money, public money, was used to advance certain campaigns. This audio recording blows out the water, the notion that there's a good ANC and a bad ANC. Ultimately, the ANC is one rotten organization. In any other country, these comments by President Ramaphosa would lead to his immediate impeachment. It is clear from these recordings that the culture of corruption is so deeply embedded in the DNA of the ANC, and it is truly an irredeemable organization. It has been reported that valuable records stored at Parliament have been damaged or destroyed in the fire earlier this year. Now, these records date back to 1910 and have significant legal and historical significance to us all. However, Parliament claims that these documents have been successfully digitized and backed up. Well, Parliament, show us the backups. We want to see that, in fact, these records have been stored successfully. 
The special investigating unit's report into the theft of COVID-19 funds has now been released. This report has found that over half a billion rand still needs to be accounted for. And this figure is likely to increase as investigations continue. The theft of COVID-19 funds is perhaps the most reprehensible as these funds were meant for PPE and other life-saving equipment during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is now up to the NPA to make sure that they start to prosecute those who are guilty. We want to see corrupt politicians behind bars. The acting Chief Justice Raymond Zondo released part two of the state capture report. This section of the report deals with and reveals damning evidence of corruption and blatant abuse of power at two SOEs, Transnet and Denal. ANC ministers and enablers of state capture Len Brown and Malusi Gigaba have been implicated. The DA will work hard to ensure that this is not just another report that collects dust and that those who are responsible end up behind bars. And last but certainly not least, after sustained pressure from the DA highlighting the harm that rotational schooling has had on learners, national government has finally relented and dropped the damaging policy this week. For too long, learners have been kept out of the classroom without substantial scientific evidence to support this policy. We welcome the end of rotational schooling because we know that getting children back into the classroom is essential if South Africa is to have any future at all. Which moves us to the spotlight feature this week. We discuss national government's failure to address the major dropout crisis in our education system and the DA's plan to fix this once and for all. Let's take a look at this story in the spotlight. South African children and many others around the world lost the opportunity to have enough contact learning because of COVID-19 and the lockdown. The number of pupils not returning to school is now the highest in two decades. And it's expected these could surge in years to come if urgent interventions are not put in place. UNICEF South Africa says nearly half a million pupils have dropped out of schools over the past 16 months. And it's believed many of them are children living in informal settlements as well as in rural areas. We already have a huge problem with inequality in South Africa and the rotational learning is a affecting poorer learners disproportionately. An accelerated catch-up program at schools is needed to address the shocking rate of pupils dropping out. We need to get kids back to school, ideally on a daily basis. Rotational learning really doesn't work. And the longer this ridiculous process of rotational learning remains in place, the longer these poorer students are going to be disadvantaged and it's going yeah. to end up deepening inequality and we're going to end with a far bigger crisis than the COVID-19 pandemic ever could have brought onto South Africa if this continues. Over the past decade or so, we have seen millions of learners having dropped out of school. Given this shocking statistic, one would think that the Department of Education would do everything to get its learners back to school. However, it was revealed by the department that there are no mechanisms in place to track, to trace and keep learners in school. This is a national crisis and lockdowns have only exacerbated the situation. This is why the DA has vehemently been opposed to rotational schooling and as such went to court to compel government to get all learners back in school. This court action has led to government finally scrapping the damaging policy of rotational schooling. And so in the spotlight this week, we focus on our education system. We unpack the reasons behind our high dropout rate and also what are some of the plans that we would have in place to fix the situation. To discuss all of this and more, we are joined in studio by DA leader John Stenhazen, the DA shadow minister of uh, the basic education, Matolele Notada, and our Western Cape Provincial Minister of Education, Debbie Schaefer, and we've got Keith Richardson, the CEO of the Principals Academy Trust. Welcome, everybody. Great to be with you, sir. Great to be with the guests. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, jump straight into it. John, why did the DA go to court to get rotational schooling scrapped, and why was it important? Well, I think it was very, very important because the one group of people who've not had a voice in all of this are the, are the school, uh, are the learners, are the school children. 
who have you know, had to listen to other people making decisions about their lives. We wanted to give them a voice. We know that rotational schooling has had a devastating impact on literacy and numeracy uh, in South Africa, a country that already has very low outputs in terms of numeracy and literacy when compared both continentally and internationally. And the fact that rotational learning has disproportionately disadvantaged poorer learners from poorer communities, where it's not been possible for them to do online schooling because there's no internet connectivity or there's no devices. They've essentially missed out in many instances on over half their schooling time over this period. It's going to have a devastating long-term impact on their ability to get involved in the economy, to find a job, to study further if they want to, if they have been disadvantaged in this way. And so we felt it was very, very important to show government that we were serious about this. There's been a malaise from the national government on this issue, we believe, for far too long. Uh, and we know that the MAC did advise in July last year that rotational schooling should end. There was the, uh, that was the end of the third wave. We know we've had Omicron, but as you saw, Omicron was a lot less dangerous and a lot less virulent mm. than any of the other waves that we've had. And therefore, it made no sense to keep the rotational learning process uh, in, in place. We also very concerned around, and again, disproportionately affecting poorer learners, the impact on childhood malnutrition. For many of the learners in poorer communities, the only decent meal they get in a day is the school feeding scheme uh, meal that they get at school. If you are not getting that every day and you're only getting it every second day, it has a terrible impact on young learners' health as well and well-being. And you start to see a rise in incidents of malnutrition and the like. So it was just a bad, it was just a, a bad decision all around. And like any decision in government, you've got to always weigh the benefits of, the, of, of, of something versus the risks. In this instance, the loss of schooling, the impact on health and malnutrition and mental well-being of these students, and the opportunity cost of what's going to hold their, hold, be held in the future, far outweighs any of the risk that would be presented by Omicron or, or, or COVID-19. And therefore, we felt it was very important to put government on notice that this is something that we were going to be very, very serious about. And I think without the court case, that we, we would have still been involved in this discussion around rotational learning probably into March, April this year. Very glad the government has now seen the light. They've now said schools must go back and we've got to do it. And obviously we've got to now focus on how we get those learners mm. back up to speed, particularly on numeracy and, and literacy. When one looks at the plummeting rates of that, it is very, very worrying. And this actual decision of rotational learning could well be the longest long COVID that we have because it's going to stretch into decades to come and be felt in decades to come if we don't make up that time, if we don't get learners back into the system and then we don't get those those numbers up. Mm. Debbie, I want to come to you. I mean, it, look, I mean, there are always Com complex competing priorities in a government, right? You've got to, and I'm going to bring in Keith here at some point about, you've got to bring in the teachers, you've got to consider the trade unions, you've got to consider the learners. But the Western Cape has supported the scrapping of rotational schooling, and why is that? Yeah, we have, and you're right. It is it, it is extremely complex. And part of the problem we had as education was that the um, our national minister actually made it a little easier to go back to school, and then the Cocteau minister went and added in a regulation, the one metre rule. So that made it a lot more difficult. So we could have had primary schools back a lot earlier. But yes, it is. I mean, uh, the, the Omicron was a complexity because we didn't know at the time in advance that it was going to be you know less severe. And people mm. get very scared, and I get some very anxious parents getting quite hysterical sometimes. You know, so I've got parents on the one hand getting really worried and teachers on the other hand and unions on the other. So it, it is complex, but by the beginning of this year, I think it was quite clear that Omicron wasn't severe. So I, I, I made a public call uh, before schools opened that, that uh, the rotational timetabling should stop because of the exact reasons that John's spoken about. Mm -hmm. So yes, we certainly have, and we are very happy that it has been done. Now. Yeah. Keith, just to bring you in here, particularly about these competing interests. I mean, you know, you heading up an organization that has, you know, dealt with matters in education for a long time. I mean, as David he says there are there are multiple stakeholders here that have had to be considered and and what in your view uh, you know what the key takeaways in this whole debate around rotational schooling i think you used the key word a moment ago but if someone had asked me two years ago what's the most important uh, aspect we should be concentrating on to develop education i would have said teacher training mm. 
now we've had COVID and COVID, if it's a challenge like everything else and it has led to rethinking and it's led to a new, led to a new way of looking at things. So mm. it's actually been in some ways mm. quite good. Mm. Uh, but now if you ask me what's the key aspect of uh, getting basic education back up, I'm going to say teacher training. But this time with a capital T <laughs> for teacher and a capital T for training. Yeah. And uh, because the the issue now is is that teachers have to do more than just deliver the curriculum. Yeah. Now they've got to come in and they've and they've got to catch up. So I'll give you examples. I'll give some examples of schools that I'm currently in. Mm. Uh, a grade three teacher, grade four teachers are now taking on children who for two years basically haven't done any reading. Yeah. So how do you start teaching grade three? Mm. Uh, when they've yeah. got all this catch-up to do. Yeah. So the dilemma and the challenge facing the education department, Debbie, is uh, mm. how are you going to catch up? What at the same time, uh, what do you do with the current syllabus? Yeah. Another example, and another school I was at yesterday, the, they showed me, so this is not hearsay, yeah. but they showed me their statistics from 2020 in grade four and five. And... From March when we all went off, yeah. uh, they their fours and fives were only at school for 16 days oh. for the entire year. <laughs> So now, who wants to be a minister of education? <laughs> uh, <because laughs> now, you, you, uh, what are you going to do yeah. about this problem? Yeah. And then a school us in this morning, before I came here, was a high school, and they gave a baseline test to all their grade eights in maths. Yeah. And less than 5% of them are up to uh, grade eight standard. Sure. Some of them going right down to grade two standard. Yeah. So well. these are things that we've got to tackle. And, uh, and I think that the teachers now need support. Yeah. They need to be upskilled. Yeah. They need to have the they need to have their HODs, their heads of subjects, their academic heads. They've got to be trained up yeah. to help their their teachers. Uh, that principals have got to support their their management. Mm. Uh, the the curriculum advisors have got to come in, and yeah. they've got to be part of it. And it's now a team effort yeah. to get this right. And they yeah. can't. And we've got to be talking to one another. I mean, uh, you know, Keith Bax uh, highlights some key, you know, diagnoses some of the key problems, particularly that have been brought about by COVID. Uh, but also one of the key indicators in our education system is the metric pass rate, particularly if you look at the dropout rate and such. So, I mean, in your view, how has COVID really changed this whole thing? And, and I mean, you know, as the DA, what have we been pushing for? Look, just to add on to what Keith is, is actually saying is that, I mean, Nick Spall did a, re a research and said, you know, by June this year, a grade three learner will only know what a grade two learner knew in 2019. Yeah. And just to, you know, to even exacerbate the problem, it's not just, uh, you know, 50% uh, of the lost time just generally, mm. but for rural and poor communities, it's between 50 and 80% actually that they've lost the time. Um, and one of the massive things that uh, this has affected is the dropout rate, mm. you know. Um, there's millions of young uh, South African learners that actually drop out of school, hundreds of thousands of them even recently now because of the rotational system, because it discourages learning, number one. Uh, but, uh, you know, Stats SA also reports to us that of the 10.2 million South Africans that are, are youth, 3.3 yeah. million of them are not in education, employment or training. Uh, and there's various reasons why learners drop out. Mm -hmm. You know, the rotational system is, is one of them. There are some that are child-headed households. You know, you know, you'll find that you know, parents contribute to learners dropping out. And just the unconducive learning environments mm -hmm. in schools, you know. You've got schools that are still of mud, asbestos, some have got pit toilets. And, you know, quality teaching is also mm -hmm. a challenge. So there are various aspects uh, and dynamics that actually, it's multifaceted mm -hmm. that forces learners mm -hmm. uh, to drop out. And I think the massive challenge, though, is that there's no one uh, tracking and tracing mechanism to find out where are these learners. You know, mm. some of them could have gone to vocational training, which is a good thing to mm. do. Um, and, and some of them can be completely part of the 3.3 million that I just mentioned now. Um, and there's no tracking, tracing, there's no retention strategy uh, to, to get these learners back on board. And I think that's one of the ma ma massive and key issues that we need to re resolve. I, mean, I, I, I just want to just, just ask something here as well and, and just bring this into, into the equation. We live in one of the most unequal societies in the world. Mm. Inequality is a huge problem mm. in South Africa. It's internationally recognized that one of the best levelers of inequality is good quality mm. education. Mm. If everybody gets the same starting point of a decent mm. quality education, yeah. Yeah. people are allowed to compete yeah. on it. We spend a, a healthy chunk mm. of our GDP on education. education. 
but we're not getting the results. Mm. We're in the lowest uh, in Africa on mm. STEM skills, science, mm. technology, engineering, and maths. We're amongst the lowest in the world in these key skills. Surely it, it goes beyond just the budget. Yeah. Uh, and yes. there's got to be something that, we, that we're doing wrong in South Africa if we are spending money, but we're not getting the outcomes. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. does it come down again to the teacher training, Debbie? I would love to answer that. Yeah. 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 Debbie, jump in. Yeah. Yeah. It comes up to a lot of things, and one of the key things is accountability in the system, mm. because um, there have been too much uh, co-governance by unions in education, to the point where teachers are not actually held accountable in many cases. Um, sometimes they haven't got enough opportunities, as Keith says, we need, and we have in the Western Cape concentrated a lot on our education, uh, and our upskilling and our teacher uh, continuous development, we, we certainly have. Um, but there are also inefficiencies in how the money is spent. So um, there's a huge inefficiencies in the provincial equitable share calculation, which I bang on about forever. We've only fairly recently discovered that the special needs schools are not taken into account in the calculation. There's a portion of the equitable share formula where uh, they only take into account public ordinary schools, not public sure. special schools. Mm. The result is that 6% of our learners are not being, sub being funded. Then they only look at the population part of it at learners of school going age, compulsory school going age, which is 7 to 15. So yes, there's a lot of money, but there's actually not enough money. Mm -hmm. But then it's being spent in different provinces where it shouldn't be. And then we've got like 2,000 schools in the Eastern Cape that should have been closed long ago mm -hmm. because there's no, no children in them. And the, the government just doesn't respond quickly enough to those kind of issues where the money could be better spent on things like teacher development uh, and, and those mm -hmm. kind of issues. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Keith, yeah, can I reply to John? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, John, I think the emphasis must be where we wanting to go. Do we yeah. want to just finish curricula? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or as I'm suggesting, uh, we must concentrate on getting out to scratch first, otherwise you're mm. building a house on yeah. dodgy foundations. Mm. Yeah. And I would like to suggest that curriculum advice and everyone um, comes up with the premise of you haven't taught until you've learned. Mm. And if everyone adopts that, you can't move on until they've learned. So you, your teaching must be geared towards learning. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah. we, I mean, we know there's been a resistance to, to teacher standards and teacher... Yeah. Uh, one of the big interventions, I remember Bill Clinton writes about it in his book, I mean, how he turned Arkansas from being one of the lowest educational output states in the United States into one of the best when he was governor, was taking the pain and bringing in teacher quality training mm -hmm. and standards. And as you said, you can't teach what you cannot learn. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, that it, it, uh, there's going to have to be a grasping of the nettle at some stage mm. to make sure. I've been to some schools where the teacher teaching the mathematics would struggle to pass the paper yeah, at the end yeah, of the year that's themselves. Exactly right. mm. So how do we, how do we how do we encourage the training, but then also have the minimum standards so that you that you're able to make yeah. sure that that young people are getting the quality education mm. okay. that yeah. they deserve. Yeah. And Bess, I mean, I want to bring you in here. You've done a lot of oversight around the country, uh, being seeing some of the problems that Debbie's talking about, that Keith is talking about, some of the questions that John has. I mean, w w in your view, from what you've seen, what are some of the issues? Look, I, I was about to jump into what John was raising about, mm. uh, you know, we're putting a lot of money, but we're not getting anything out of it. So there's three things, uh, first and foremost, that we've analyzed. One is that the type of curricula that we put in place must be outcome based based on being responsive to skills needed by the economy. As much as basic education is you know, numeracy, literacy, language and the basics, but there must be a pathway for you to be able to achieve that. And that's, that must be funded as, 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 as Debbie says, but the way in which you fund it, you don't put players that are trying to uh, uh, increase the prices of funding uh, you know, equipment and, and support for math, science and other you know, uh, STEM subjects that are there. But secondly, in terms of the infrastructure, you find that there are schools, for example, in Pumalanga, I visited a school in Fundo. It's built for 32 million on a wetland, um, and you know it was supposed to be built for about 16 million rand. So you're exacerbating the price of creating the infrastructure and the space so that there's conducive learning to get the outcomes. And the last and most important thing is te uh, uh, you know, uh, quality teaching. There needs to be a school uh, monitoring evaluation uh, committee or commissions in the different provinces to mon monitor quality teaching. I mean, they've got in the Western Cape where they actually monitor the quality of teaching uh, so that you actually have outcomes. So some of, some of the challenges that uh, you know, we've seen across uh, the country visiting mm. the schools, you'll find that there's some mud in asbestos schools. You find that there are schools that still uh, use pit toilets that I said, you know, and, uh, it's unconducive for learning. But majority of the teachers are complaining, you know, we're complaining that, look, the rotational system is actually not assisting us, one. We can't cover the curriculum. Our learners can't read and write, read for meaning, you know, they can't write. 
And it's, it's important for us to be able to change that first and foremost, and then come up with the strategy of how to you know, uh, catch up with the yeah. curriculum so that we are actually producing outcomes. Because we don't want to end up with a generation that is going to form part of these stats of youth unemployment, youth not in educational training, and end up living a lifetime of poverty. So these are some of the strategies that we Keith's need to put point about building the foundation, yeah. a solid foundation, yeah. going back to the basics. Yeah building that foundation and yeah. building up from there. Exactly. I want to bring in Debbie here because Mark Olile raises an important point about catching up. I mean, we've all been dealt a blow globally. It's not just a uniquely South African issue. And so, you know, now we've got a, this mammoth task of making sure that the past 18 months we catch up. Mm. What are some of the conversations that we're having to make sure that kids do? There are a lot of conversations. Last week, um, there was a basic education sector Lachotla, um, in Johannesburg, and it was extremely good, I thought. Um, and there were a lot of really good inputs from international guests as well as local. Um, and there's a feeling uh, that we have to trim down to some extent to, to get to the basic key concepts. I mean, the general consensus is that our CAPS curriculum is actually very good, um, internationally renowned. It's just, okay. it's very full. Uh, and we need to just focus on the key issues that we have to get right. And that is reading, writing, calculating, essentially in the foundation phase. So um, that is one of the things we've been concentrating on in the Western Cape for quite some time, but it obviously has been affected by COVID. So we do have to do that. Um, so there are, there are a lot of conversations happening um, at national level also as to how we're going to, to deal with this, uh, this backlog. Um, mm. It has got huge implications. There's studies done for before COVID even existed. There were studies about just four months of school closures, what effect that had on a learner's earning capacity for the rest of their life, plus obviously the economy of the country. And it ran into trillions of dollars. Sure. So so it is important. But as, uh, as has also been mentioned, our teachers have also taken strain in COVID. It's not only the, not only the learners, they've mm -hmm. taken a lot of strain. It's been extremely, uh, you know, there's been a lot of anxiety. It's been very difficult for them to have to teach half a class, half a class. They mm -hmm. then have to get the children. They've taught something two days ago and then they've forgotten it. They have to teach it over again. So. So it is really difficult and we're going to have to have an intensive, I think, particularly the foundation phase. Okay. Fortunately, there is um, at the higher grades, particularly in maths, as Keith mentioned, the, the baseline test in grade eight, um, we've found it's a really, really good um, program, that's an online program that we are, we've are we tried and it's been tried in Pumalanga actually also and we now are expanding it and if we can get more of that, you know, because teachers can't do everything themselves personally and mm -hmm. it, it adapts to the learner's individual learning gaps mm -hmm. and addresses those. So we can use that also to some extent I think, but the, the little ones need the teachers there and, and intensive intensive catch up, yeah. you yeah. know, to get back on track. And John, I mean, you know, the Bax talks about the possibility mm -hmm. of an entire lost generation. I mean, we've, we, uh, you know, our schooling system has been ailing all these years and then what you, you you know you have a situation where an entire generation of kids is likely so this is this is urgent i mean it's of something it's that urgent. should feature and, in the and service. really the thing that, that that always brings it home to me is that this is the way we're going to deal with inequality this mm. is the way you're going to create mm. a more equal society yeah. when everyone is given the same starting point yeah. and given access to opportunity that way you you have an equality of opportunity, not an equality of outcome. Mm. And you then have people with a foundation to be able to go on and be entrepreneurs, on mm. technologists, mm. engineers, all these skills that South Africa needs to get moving uh, are, are there. This is the raw material, mm. Mm. but we're not turning it, we're not beneficiating it mm. into productive mm. members of society, mm. which is why we sit with school leavers, people mm. even finish school, without work, mm. in an environment, economy where you've got a 42% unemployment rate, mm. it is devastating. Yeah. But education is one of the key rungs on the ladder of opportunity mm. to get people out of poverty and into opportunity. Yeah. And we're going to have to, as a country, yeah. as Keith has said, work together. Uh, mm. Educators, mm. learners, unions, uh, policy makers, to really do something drastic, because I really do worry that the rest of the world is going to catch up, yep. make up the time, and once again, South Africa is going to be left behind and the world will be waving goodbye as they, as they move mm. on to the next level mm. and we're still, still stuck in the past. We've got to do something and got to do it urgently, which is why you know, we passionately went forward with this rotational learning case. Mm. Court cases aren't cheap, and no. I would rather mm. have spent the money on mm. political pamphlets or mm. a political activity, but I understand how how deeply unequal the rotational learning yeah. policy yeah. affected poorer communities. People who don't have a voice at the table, yeah. Yeah. people who don't have someone rooting for them in national government. Yeah. And I thought it was important that as the DA, we give a voice to those poor people and to those learners 
and fight for their future. Yeah. And I mean, Keith, you talk about teacher training as one of the ways in which we can catch up because I, I do want to, I, I want to hear you, all your views about this. Um, you talk about teacher training as a way to catch up what has been lost. What other things can we do and working together? What other things can we do to make sure that we kind of leapfrog kids to at least get to a decent place of making up the last 18 months? Look, even if you just concentrate on that on a basic level, we've done a good job because if you can get your, uh, your heads of department, if you can get this in, within the schools for, uh, for training and learning, uh, training of teachers to take place, mm. and then uh, your management get changed. Well, if you do that, that is a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. And you asked me earlier on about teacher dropout, and then we got, si I mean, sorry, um, pupil dropout. Yeah. And we got sidetracked a little bit there. Yeah. But again, I'm going to say it is really everything is down to the teacher. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's the teacher's job to create confidence in children. And if children are confident, they're less likely to drop out. Yeah. I mean, everyone here are masters of their craft and you've got confidence in what you do. And we've got to get our children to that level as well. Yeah. And we've got to make sure that at foundation phase they can read. And there's a school of thought that if you can read by the end of grade three with comprehension mm. and with understanding, mm. you will revolutionize this country yeah. mm. if you can just concentrate on that. Yeah. And how do you get people to read? It is just confidence. But I am hearing more and more stories about people didn't even bother to write matric because they said, we're not going to yeah. pass, so yeah. why try? Yeah. You know, and so all the way through school, the teacher's job is to say, I'm on your team. I'm here to support you. Mm. We're going to do this together. And I tell you what, you, you will get retention then. And if yeah. you've got reading by the end of grade three and you've got retention from one to seven and then eight to 12, you'll change your education yeah. in this country. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, and you would think that that would be a catalytic change for yeah. South Africa. Yeah. It would be a huge you change. You said it would be a revolutionary change, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. was yeah. How do we retain kids in school? Why do we have a problem of high dropout rates? Look, the first and, and, and foremost, we, we need to look at innovative ways. Uh, you know, one of them is obviously giving confidence and quality teaching in schools, like, as Keith has mentioned. But we need to develop a home and online school uh, policy mm. that will alleviate the pressure of one, of, you know, the pressure in classroom and learners being able to do it. And there's been innovations that have been done by UCT and this has been piloted. Um, and that it does, it actually does work. And we need to now get caps onto that system and make sure that we're actually educating learners that have got that option so they don't crowd them. And the second thing is that we need to track and trace learners from the classroom in the school. The province keeps a database and then we check because it's dynamic. Some are child-headed households, like I said, some are discouraged of learning. I mean, there's 29,000 le learners that didn't write matric, you know, mm. because of, of the confidence issue. So where are they, you know, mm. in the system? Where can we find them? Okay, cool, they're in vocational uh, learning, then that's fine. Do, what's the, where, where's the remainder of them? Yeah. And how do we retain them to ensure that we encourage them uh, in learning? Mm. Some learners struggle with, you know, financial support. Mm. You know, what are the pathways and mechanisms that we can give to make sure that we actually keep them in school? Yeah. So some of these, some of some of the some of these are the dynamics that we can, you know, that we have to deal with to make sure that we try and keep learners in yeah. school. But I also think it's got to be a whole of government yeah. approach. Yeah. And I yeah. think this is what Debbie yes. talks about a lot. Mm. Is that you know a lot of the burden is being put onto the school yeah. or mm. to the Department of Education. Yes. Mm -hmm. So some of the innovative things we should be looking at. We've got a whole Department of Social yes. Development. Yeah. People accessing child support grants yeah. should have to produce proof that their children are enrolled at school. Yes, absolutely. Correct. That they, you know, it, it mm. can't just be a, well, here's money mm. for you to look after your child. Mm. It is in the best interest of the child. And if you go back to the Constitution, mm. it talks about mm. decisions always being made in the best interest of the child. Yeah. It is the best interest for any child in South Africa to go to school. Mm. And therefore, I think we've got to be a lot more innovative in, in a whole of yeah. government approach. Yeah. Mm. So the burden doesn't just fall on, on, yeah. on Department of Basic yeah. Education. So, it is a responsibility yeah. that's shared throughout government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to make sure that, that, yeah. that, that not only yeah. are you tracking and tracing, yeah. but there is incentivization yeah. to make sure that yeah. children are enrolled in school right. and that, that they remain in school. Yeah. Yeah. Debbie, like, like the health system, the education system becomes also a bit of a catchment for like all kinds of uh, societal yes, issues. Indeed. And mm -hmm. what are some of the issues that you are picking up that also, um, you know, contribute to this kind of dropout and this kind of yeah. issues that we're seeing? Um, yeah, first of all, I just want to say, like, you know, I mean, John's quite correct. We can't have education department responsible for everyone who drops out and what they do after that. You yes. know? Yes. So we do need a system, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just where that system sits, I think. Yeah. And there needs to be a lot more synergy between us and higher education also. So yeah. see those who do go to TV. But one of the reasons we found, and we have identified the issue of foundation phase quite some time ago, we've had a lot of emphasis on foundation phase teaching and learning to, to do exactly that. Mm. We're not where we would like to be, but we 
certainly have seen. Um, we're the only province that has systemic testing in grade three, six, and nine. Once again, the unions don't agree with it. Um, but I mean, we found it very useful, and we found it very useful because it actually diagnoses problems in every classroom, literally every classroom. So it can be used by uh, the principals at the school to then assist with programs to, to address those issues that are problematic. So mm -hmm. that's one issue. Um, other things, of course, I mean, that it's, it is true about issues of, um, of confidence and so on and, and of teachers. And one of the things we've brought in the last few years in the Western Cape is a called a Transform to Perform program, part of which is a change mindset and a growth mindset program. So yeah. we have change mindset for teachers because very often the teachers, particularly in poor communities, um, have this uh, kind of attitude that, well, you're from a poor community, you're stupid, you can't go anywhere in life and that's it. You yeah. know. So And also they have difficulty dealing with the circumstances they have to teach in. Mm. Many of them have to duck bullets while their gangs are fighting and so on. So we, we're helping the teachers with that mm. and we're also helping the learners with the growth mindset project to try and ensure that they get that belief in themselves installed, that they can do it. And we, we saw, we've we started with some of our metrics and it is starting to show some promise. It's still very mm. early, yeah. but it is starting to show some promise. Of course, there are also issues of safety and gangsterism. It's a big problem for us. Learner pregnancies, we have addressed that quite well. Um, you know, we, we do provide a lot of support for, for learners who get pregnant so that they don't drop out of school. Um, and yeah, I mean, money is an issue sometimes, but we, you know, we do provide a hang of a lot of free services for education. I mean, people who can't pay um, do not have to pay school fees. Um, learner transport can be a problem in the cities because our policy only extends to rural communities. Yeah. But okay. anyone who lives five kilometres or more from a school is entitled to learner transport and they get it. So, I mean, very often it does boil down to parents just not taking responsibility. And yeah. I've just recently had a case where I've had, you know, closed a school. It had 19 children in it with one teacher. That's not beneficial for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. But people are saying, you're creating orphans. I said, no, you're not. Just please help us get your children to the school that they can go to and we will provide transport for it. Yeah. So it is also a parental yeah. responsibility to make sure that they, and in the latest billable uh, amendments, which have just been tabled in Parliament, um, the minister is actually wanting to increase the sanction for anyone who does not send their compulsory school going age child to school. Sure. So, mm. yeah. Well, which is, which is a good thing. Yeah. Absolutely. If it's enforced, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> I want to start with you, Keith. Final parting shots on what should be done to fix broadly. I know that there are a number of things. Uh, what, should, what should be our priorities? Uh, very quickly around our education system and at least plugging in the holes that are kind of bleeding at the moment. I'll just have to bang on about teachers. If you've got your <laughs> teachers, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can pour money into school buildings and yeah. you can do it, but it's actually teachers at the end of the game that are going to make, that are going to change mm. the system. It's yeah. been proven around the world. Mm. Uh, you were mentioning off air just now that Scandinavia have more teachers with master's degrees. You know, with teachers, things will change. Yeah. But I think that where we've got to move forward now, you know, we've had two years of fear. We've been frightened of COVID. We've been frightened of what's going to happen. Mm. Where's it going to go? Long COVID, you mentioned early mm. on. Um, and now we must move into the era of fear of what's going to happen to our children. Yeah. And that's the new fear. And are they going to get left behind? And are they going to have a future? Absolutely. And when I told one of my principals I was going to come on to this panel, she said to me, do it for South Africa. Go <laughs> and say how important the teachers are yeah. in changing the yeah. system. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. What are your marching orders for the next year in the, in the, in the very important portfolio of basic education? Look, like I said, uh, one, we need to have a curriculum that's responsive to mm. the economy and industry, entrepreneurship and innovation. Number two, we have, have to have innovative ways, like we've mentioned, how to retain and keep learners in school. Thirdly, we must deal with the long-term systematic issues in basic education to make sure that when we fund uh, infrastructure, we actually do it out of quality outcomes and not people using that opportunity to actually make money out of it. And I think uh, most importantly, like Keith has said, we need to have a school evaluations monitoring you know, authority that can monitor quality teaching mm. and also encourage that, you know, that type of mindset that Debbie spoke about for teachers and learners so that we don't have a generation, like I said earlier, that is going to be dependent on the state and is going to live a lifetime of poverty. And with these things, we can set up a pathway uh, and an opportunity ladder for the future for, for, for our learners. And I think that's the most important thing. And we'll continue doing that work uh, and oversight and trying to make sure that uh, government actually does what it needs to do. And I just say that, that mm. we've heard a couple of times now about teacher evaluation. I think it's absolutely critical. Mm. I think it's absolutely critical that it's taken seriously. And I think it's absolutely critical that teachers see it as a way of improving mm. and mm. not as a way of being, or something about police. Yeah. 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 And I think it's essential for the teacher evaluation. Yeah. Yeah.
Debbie, your marching orders, I mean, it's a big year. Uh, already started off very difficult, but you've already gotten a win in your bag. Uh, we've got, yes. I mean, this results. No, the trick results. And, you know. And you don't purge learners, so that's also <laughs> good. Great <laughs> matric results, uh, scrapped rotational schooling. Now, where to from now? I agree with Keith completely about teacher, but I'll go a step further and actually promote his uh, organizations like his, and, and that's actually the principles. I mean, mm. pr the, the training of principles and instructional leadership is crucial, and then mm. obviously the teachers too, to enable them to continuously develop themselves. Uh, and I've also seen it time and time again, when you've got a principal who's not running the school well, the whole school suffers, and vice versa. So I would go instructional leadership for principals, definitely teach development, and get those foundation phase gaps go, um, addressed as soon as possible. Mm. John, an incapable state can and create a massive, massive problem for generations to come. What are your marching orders for the Democratic Alliance in ensuring that we're also solutions orientated like we were in taking mm. government to court? Well, I, I think that you, you've got to, we've got to be clear about what our enemy is in South Africa mm. and our biggest enemy is poverty. It underlies our um, infant mortality rate, it underlies our HIV AIDS rate, uh, it, it underlies our malnutrition, etc. We've got to tackle poverty. Mm. And one of the best ways to tackle poverty is producing citizens who can compete in an economy uh, able to find work, are able to st have startups, to be entrepreneurs, and are able to fill the technical skills gap that South Africa desperately needs. We're only going to get to that to that front line against poverty, we've got a good quality education system that gives children the confidence to be able to become active citizens, to become productive citizens, and to be able to, to march confidently mm. into the future of South Africa. I don't want our big entrepreneurs to leave South Africa. I want them to stay in South Africa and help us tackle poverty. Mm. And that has got to be our singular thing. And I've told the dear, you know, we, the ANC is part of the problem. The, um, there's so many parts of the problem. The big enemy is poverty, mm -hmm. and we've got to find a way to deal with it. And education, to me, is one of the silver bullets, mm -hmm. one of the game changers mm -hmm. that lies at, at us beating poverty. If we can get our education system working well, producing the results, giving us productive citizens who've got a best shot of competing, not only in South Africa, yeah. but competing internationally, yeah. I think that it'll be a game changer for South Africa. And it changes the system and doesn't just deal mm. with issues at a surface level, right? Because that Absolutely. can be a big problem with, uh, with you know, our political mm. debate and, and our mm. issues in Parliament. Yeah. But you see, that's the problem. Mm. This is not like, and this is the problem, I'm afraid, with national government, mm. is that we focus on the ribbon cutting and the, yeah. you know, the look at me, mm. we're delivering project. We don't focus enough on the opportunity side of the economy mm. and where we can grow opportunity in South yeah. Africa. And education is undoubtedly one of the A lot of things we've spoken about today are not sexy. Mm. They're not going to make headlines. Yeah. But they are the hard yards that any country has to get right mm. if it's going to progress. And yes, you're not going to, it's not glamorous doing teacher training and yeah. doing teacher evaluation. It's not glamorous, you know, doing some of the things we've spoken about. Foundation you're phase. You're not going to be able to picture on the front page of the newspaper because you've run the best foundation phase. Yeah. But it is essential because if you don't have those foundations, as Keith has said, you're building your community halls, your infrastructure on an incredibly shaky foundation that's eventually going to collapse. Mm, mm. Let's get these foundations mm. right, build up from there. Is this a little teaser of what we're to expect next week at the True Sonar, uh, True uh, State of the Nation address? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think it's an obvious. It, it's an obvious. We've mm. got to fight poverty in this country. There are, there are 30 million people who live below the poverty line in South Africa. Their cause has to be our concern. Yeah. And we need to be focusing on the opportunity side of the economy looking at how we can help those people out of poverty into opportunity and allow them to build a life of value and to leave a legacy for their children and build a better future for those that come after them. Mm, mm. Thank you so much, Keith, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing mm. and yeah, your yeah. organizations. Yeah. And uh, thank you for coming on to the program and uh, also just lending us and showing us some of the wisdom that you've gathered over the years. So thank you, and thank mm. you, Debbie. For I know it's uh, incredibly busy, um, but thank you so much for making the time. Mm. And thank you to our wonderful guests, John and Bax. And uh, we'll be back after this.
in cities across the country. Cape Town allocates 600 million rand to free basic services. DLED Medval receives its eighth consecutive clean audit and Twane is planning to recruit 5,000 new job seekers. Where we govern, the DA truly gets things done. Now, on to this week's DA to Work feature, we speak to the Executive Mayor of Umgeni Municipality, Chris Papas. Chris, hello, my favorite mayor in South Africa. Are you well? I'm well, so I'm sure you say that to all the mayors, but you're definitely my favorite <laughs> inside track post. <laughs> Listen, I want to find out, I mean, what an exciting time. It's probably been a whirlwind for you uh, since, uh, since uh, the 1st of November. How has it been? Uh, how is it going uh, in, uh, in Umgeni, our first year-run municipality in KwaZulu-Natal? It's going well. So um, it's a lot of hard work. Um, things are a lot worse than what we expected, uh, you know, looking in from opposition benches. Um, the road ahead is going to be long, um, but we're making progress. And the important thing is we're getting buy-in and there's, a, there's an incredible vibe and atmosphere in all communities. You know, people want to see things happen. And we're just drawing off that energy, the, you know, the sort of the hope and inspiration of the community. So, yeah, making progress slowly um, and, and trying to sort out the, the basic things, the operational issues in the municipality so we can start to deliver. Yeah. You speak, I mean, about what you found. I mean, this is a common theme for our new DA governments where people say, look, I mean, we thought things were bad from opposition benches until we got into government and we started to uncover the true extent of the rot. And so, I mean, what are some of the things that you found, particularly when it pertains to corruption in the municipality, which has hindered service delivery in a big way? So I think the most obvious thing is, is the incredible sort of inflation of prices. So, you know, I, I, I've, what I've tried to do is, is bring in, you know, private sector guys to, to give us quotes comparatively to what has been, been charged. Um, you would have heard during the election campaign of, of the South Africa's most expensive Wendy House. You know, yes. It's those sorts of things where there's been a lot of top slicing, a lot of, you know, inflation of, of uh, contracts or, or quotations. Um, the, the other thing is the appointment of, of people irregularly. And when I say irregular, I mean people who aren't qualified or skilled to do the work. Uh, we recently completed a skills audit where 30% or 28% of our employees are neither skilled nor qualified to, for the positions that they are in. So, I mean, there's another issue. You know? so, so how is our HR department functioning so that we end up with the, these sorts of people? But mm. we are faced with a situation where we have, uh, you know, an SIU report that you, you spoke about the corruption in terms of, of the um, COVID, COVID funds. So we are, we are in there. We've, we've got yeah. 19 and a half million rand who, that has been, oh. been misused. Uh, and we're investigating that and we're making sure that those who are implicated in the SIU report uh, will be held accountable. So yeah. there's, there's a number of ongoing issues. Yeah, and that's exactly what I wanted to, to, to jump into, Chris, to say, look, I mean, now you've uncovered these things um, in your first 100 days. I don't know if it has been 100 days, but in your first 100 days, what have been some of the things that you think, look, we've, we're have making progress, we've managed to do these couple of things to try and get us to a better place than when we found this municipality? Sure, so I, th I think we've got a, a, about half a month more before we get to our 100 days. But when we took over office, there's, there's very few systems and processes, procedures, standard operating procedures and things like that in place. So the stuff that we're, we've been doing is not the stuff that people get to see. You know, often you, you get into government and you want to you know, jump in and fix the potholes. You want to start painting. You want to do all of those sorts of things. But just a couple of examples. We own 40 brush cutters, four work. We own six tractors, one works. Um, you know, we have 101 critical vacancies. So it's all yeah. these sorts of things that the public don't see that we're trying to, to sort out. Um, but in doing so, we are trying to modernize our institution as well, you know, making sure that our organogram is not from 60 years ago, making sure that the positions fulfill the needs of the community and things like that. So, I mean, there have been some, some, some 
sort of tangible achievements, the ones that you yeah. can see or visible yeah. at least. The Curry's Post landfill site, um, it's still a challenge, but there's vast improvement and people can now access it. Um, there have been issues that relate to our, our transparency in the way that we hire. So we've instituted a, a sort of a lottery system uh, okay. where, we, where we hire our EPWP and our CWP workers, so your temporary staff. So that's become much more transparent and much more fair. So there, mm. there's those things that we have been working on. Mm. And as John was saying earlier, some of these things, like you saying, they're not sexy, you know, they're, they're, it's not ribbon cutting. It's now fixing and uprooting the rot that is in the system so that when you start delivering in things that people can see, it's done fairly, it's done transparently, and it's also not done behind smoky dark rooms where, you know, there's a lot of top slicing. So it's important work, not always visible but incredibly important work yeah abs absolutely i mean it's the foundational stuff that you need you know sil silly things and i call them silly because they're not visible but a cost containment policy or a fruitless wasteful and irregular expenditure policy so if you haven't got those things in place you can't hold people accountable and you can't expect your staff to know what to do when presented with situations that might get us into trouble as a municipality so all these things are happening in the background to make us ready or build capacity institutionally to be able to deliver services to the people. Two more things, Chris, that I want to find out from you. We've seen um, with the floods uh, that have affected a number of people um, who are in your municipality, there's been quite a number of interventions coming from, from the municipality. How has that been like dealing with? So, yeah, it was actually quite an incredible storm that hit us. Um, it, it wasn't sort of isolated in one part of the municipality. It was wall-to-wall -wall damage. Uh, our sure. assessment came up just for infrastructure. This is not human-related, but, but infrastructure-related was 272 million rand, which is more than half our annual budget. So, sure. we, we, you know, on top of dealing with 22 years' worth of ANC governance, we are now dealing with this particular issue. But we've had an incredible response in terms of humanitarian need. Uh, we've partnered with a, a number of NGOs and a number of, of private sector um, sort of sponsors. Uh, SAPI Forestry has been of great assistance, um, Gift of the Givers, our local NGOs. People have really come on board. The communities, you know, just coming together to say there's other communities in need. What can we do to help? Uh, we had farmers come out to, to clear trees that had fallen on informal settlements. So, like, again, there's this incredible want or desire to work to all people to work together and help each other across communities. Um, and we're just trying to harness that energy to build a society uh, where, you know, people feel as if they're part of the same future. Uh, and dealing with the storm has, you know, sort of it's, it's helped in a way. So it's tragic, but it's really brought people together as well. And then, I mean, one of the things that I realized when I was there uh, campaigning with you uh, was that you were incredibly passionate about youth unemployment um, and particularly youth opportunities. And so well, how have you, you know, what are some of the things you're identifying that you're wanting to do to create uh, employment opportunities for young people as somebody who's particularly young yourself and who sees the deep need in some of the communities in Umgeni? So I think John spoke about it as well um, earlier about creating, you know, an, an opportunity society. So it's not just about, you know, the handouts. It's not about giving people things. It's about improving the, the, the their situation around them so that they can actually improve themselves, mm. um, or to create an environment where those opportunities are easily accessible. So from small things, we're working to um, expand our, our Wi-Fi network so that people can access, you know, jobs and information more freely. Um, we are working to build more private sector partners. And um, one of those is, for example, is with the Howick Falls Precinct Development, which will, you know, be our version of the VNA Waterfront or the Durban Promenade. Mm. Um, because we realize as a municipality, if, we, if we're going to try and do things ourselves, which we shouldn't be anywhere as a municipality, it's going to take years and years and years to get anywhere. So we need yeah. to create private sector partners that will bring those opportunities in. But also just lending an ear to the youth. Um, I'm attending a, 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 it's an unemployment uh, forum for, yeah. for youth uh, next week. So, and, and the purpose of that is to listen to, to you know, we, we don't want to be a government that imposes. We want to be a government that takes instruction and listens from to its citizens and then tries as best as possible to roll out as many of those suggestions as possible. Mm. And 
mean, and lastly, Chris, I mean, do you, I mean, I think it's absolutely incredible that we have got a uh, young leadership in, in, in Umgeni municipality, because I do think that young people to the front. And uh, uh, how has been the response from from people and the municipality, no officials, sometimes Abandu Batibana, you know, they get very apprehensive about the fact that, you know, there's a new government coming in. Um, how has just been the reception with a community, say, as Mgeni, municipality, as the new leadership, when I know no, no Sandil? I think of Balagi Luguti, Umas Kuluma, Pagati, Sikuluma, Goglalela, first of all. Um, because people have been ignored for so long, um, and and you want you want to know that. Listen, we're a new government, but we we are a listening government. We're a responsive yeah. government. So all balolegi luguti si pendula bantu. Nomu intenga ni noma nje gu imbozo bonaga luguti na lomundo. It's not they would never expect a response. So to be to be very responsive. And I think mm -hmm. as as younger leaders, we we are able to do that. We are able to engage with people, get to more places, be more responsive, and people have appreciated that a lot more than the, the previous government. But in terms of our own staff as well, to just give them a platform to talk, um, they've been there's been so much political interference, and all we had to do is say, listen, we're going to take a step back, sit and tell us what your problems are, what you need to get your job done. Because, mm -hmm. because people want to work. People want to be proud to come to work and they can, you know, stand in the line at pick and pay. And if someone says something about the municipality, they can turn around and say, no, I actually work there uh, and I'm proud mm -hmm. to work there. And, and that's what we've done. We've opened up platforms for our staff to talk to us. Um, and then likewise with, with members of the public. Yeah. Well, Chris, thank you so very much. And uh, thank you to the work that you uh, and the deputy mayor are doing. And we are saying continue delivering to the people of Umgeni. And we will be back after this. for joining us. The State of the Nation address next week Thursday will be a crucial moment to reassure the nation that our democratic institutions are intact and are functional. Now more than ever, we need real leadership. And that is why DA leader John Stenazen will deliver his true State of the Nation address next week Tuesday to table practical solutions to our most pressing problems. Watch it live on the DA's Facebook and YouTube pages from 11.15. Until next time, keep it tight, Mzadzi.